so welcome to module five. Now we will investigate the process of selling properties you own to capture profits and reinvest them into building an even bigger portfolio. Now I want you to remember something. Even if you're thinking, well, I don't own any properties yet. That's why I took this course because I want to learn how to invest. That's fine. But you need to know about selling strategy because income property of course, you know what I think. It's the most historically proven asset class, but it's also the most tax favored asset class. And one of the great things is you can sell it all your life and not pay taxes. You can just defer, defer, defer through something we're going to learn more about called the 1031 tax deferred exchange. You can't do this with stocks. You can't do this with bonds. You can't do this with a business that you start and sell, but you can do it with income property. So there's a lot of great stuff here. Many people think about buying properties far more than they think about how they'll go about selling properties they own. We gotta talk about this. We gotta talk about selling. You'll learn the five key considerations of property disposition, pricing dynamics, sales economics, selling to owner occupants or selling to investors and seller financing. So let's jump in. Module five, we're gonna learn a lot here. Hey, it's Jason Hartman and I wanna welcome you back to another lesson where we talk about pricing dynamics. So what are the things that, that cause a property to sell or to languish on the market? Well, as we dive into this lesson, our learning objectives are, we're gonna learn these factors, the factors that influence the sale of a property and the price at which it sells. We're going to learn about how information in terms of pricing information is communicated throughout a marketplace. And we're going to learn the cost and commissions associated with selling a property so that we can be better at cashing out and selling and getting our, hopefully locking in some capital gains, some nice profits. So what factors influence the sales price of a property? Well, certainly the most basic rule of economics is obviously supply and demand. The supply of property on the market, a huge factor. When there's more inventory that is being built or coming into a market because of uh, more foreclosures or more people just deciding for whatever reason to move, uh, that will create more competition for buyers. And by the way, I need to say that with this lesson, we're painting the concept of pricing dynamics with a bit of a broad brush because commercial properties versus residential properties definitely have uh, some, some certain distinctions to them. Uh, the customs and the closing costs are different. Pricing strategies can be different too. So just understand that at the outset, but uh, probably the bulk of our uh, listeners, our students taking this course are looking to do either residential properties, single family homes, or apartment buildings. So I think you'll find that these price, this talk on pricing dynamics applies pretty well to that. When inventory is removed from the market, when supply is constrained, obviously that creates upward pressure on prices and it becomes what's called a seller's market. Demand for properties in the market. Well, within a given market area, there is a certain amount of demand for properties within a certain a price and location segment. Now, keep in mind, whenever you hear these statistics where people are talking about, you know, quote, the real estate market, I can't stand that because they paint it with such a broad brush. They uh, usually talk about the whole country as a market, and that's just completely ridiculous because as we learned early in this course, there are three major types of markets. There are nearly 400 metropolitan statistical areas. Each of those MSAs, as they're called, has different submarkets within them. And then within any market, you have different segmentations based on price, based on the age of the inventory, based on the, the housing type. You know, if we're talking about housing, is it single family? Is it townhome? Is it condo? So <laughs> they always fail to dice this stuff up enough. And that's why you got to take everything you hear in the media with a grain of salt for sure. Okay, so so take it with a grain of salt 
and apply some of the stuff that we talk about in the course to drill down deeper. So, you know, there's a certain demand in the market, right? But that demand can increase or decrease as we've seen in past lessons, as we've talked about employers uh, moving into an area or moving out of an area and uh, how areas become blighted or gentrified and what happens in those markets. So the level of market demand as buyers enter or exit the market is typically due to changes in their employment status or the access to financing. So remember this. These are, the, these are not the only drivers, but they are really powerful drivers because people tend to go where the jobs are. And when financing is really easy to get and interest rates are low and financing is cheap, but not only is it cheap and easy to get, uh, well, I mean, easy to get in the terms of, you know, is it easy to qualify? Are the banks liberal in their lending policies at that time? Or has the pendulum swung back and are, there, are they very conservative so that they don't want to make loans and they tighten up and, uh, and, and really make it hard to get a loan and make the borrower jump through a lot of hoops? So those are definitely some of the factors. So how is this information? Because that's really what it is. Pricing data is just another form of information. How is it communicated within a marketplace? Well, certainly higher sales volume shows people, and people can see this out there because if it's a residential area, you know, they drive up and down the streets and they see what's going on to some extent. You know, they look in various publications, they look online. If it's a commercial property, you know, they're, they're either very experienced as an investor and they know that marketplace, or they're dealing with a broker or a consultant who's providing data to them on the sales volume. And uh, what if it's worsening? What if financing is uh, more difficult or more expensive? Well, that's certainly going to decrease demand. In migration, we've talked about that before. Well, that definitely is a factor in upward price pressure on both commercial and residential properties. And of course, you have to segment that too, right? Because what type of in-migration is it? What, uh, what uh, if, it's, if it's residential, what types of properties can those people moving into an area afford? And if it's a commercial property, what type of properties will those people uh, influence in terms of the commercial real estate landscape? Uh, do they like to shop? Do they like restaurants? Are they going to occupy offices? Or are they blue collar workers who will occupy industrial properties? So those are all definitely things to consider. Well, what if there are corporate layoffs and there's job flight, meaning jobs are leaving the area? What if the government in a given area has very business unfriendly policies causing companies to move out or at least not expand, well, that definitely is going to cause downward pressure on prices. How about uh, property prices and sales volume? Well, they are a large part of the, co the economy as a whole. You know, it's been said that the housing market is the economy because it is such a huge part of the economy. When housing is going one direction or another, it has vast, wide-ranging implications for the broader economy as a whole. Pricing your property to sell means incorporating all of these factors so you've got to understand them to be a good seller. You've got to understand these pricing dynamics. Now, one of the th criticisms people make about real estate that I actually think is a benefit is the fact that it's not very liquid. People that invest in Wall Street stocks and so forth, and I'm no fan of those, of course, uh, they, they like the fact that you can go to a computer, you can click your mouse, and you can buy or sell stock in a second. And they think that's great. Well, I think that liquidity in the stock market creates a lot of volatility. The fact that real estate has a high cost to trade makes it more illiquid because it's slower moving and it's costly to trade it, and so that makes it more stable. I view this as a huge benefit. So commissions, that's a big part of a sales cost, and they are generally paid by the seller, although not always, just typically, 
And that means, you know, when you sell a property, it's not the gross price, but the net price after commissions and other closing costs. Typically, uh, uh, you know, commissions, they're, they're not fixed by law. They're definitely not fixed by law. In fact, that's a little bit of a typo. Uh, they're never fixed by law, but typically you're going to see people, uh, brokers out there, probably trying to get 5 or 6% of the sales price. But these are definitely negotiable. Commissions, remember, are negotiable and they are not fixed by law. Closing costs also, they add up to a pretty significant uh, portion. Now, closing costs are different in different areas because they just have developed over time as a custom. Uh, there usually aren't any laws about who has to pay what cost, although... Well, I don't want to say never on that because sometimes there are, but uh, typically these are all just negotiable or they're customary and different areas grow up in different ways and evolve in different ways and have different customs as to who pays the title insurance, who pays the transfer tax, uh, who pays the escrow fees or the settlement attorney. So these are all different, but know that they can be expensive. They make the cost of trading real estate relatively high compared to some other asset classes, and they need to be deducted from the sales price. So some key points here. To sell a property, one of the buyers in the marketplace needs to see your property, this property they're buying, as a superior value compared to all of the other properties out there. And just remember, what you paid for the property is totally irrelevant to the buyer. They don't care. And you know, most of the time, you should be glad they don't care because you probably paid a lot less than they're going to pay you. In fact, <laughs> there's a name for this. In frothy markets, they have this theory called the greater fool theory. And it basically goes like this. And it's the seller saying it, or the buyer uh, at the time saying, no matter what I pay for the property, some greater fool will come along and pay even more. And you know, that's like the game of musical chairs. It works to a point, but then eventually the music stops and someone gets stuck holding a property that they probably thought they were going to make a profit on. And then they ended up either having to wait a long time until the market recovers or losing money altogether. So setting a price above the market typically results, results of course, in a longer time to sell or not selling at all. Because when the price trend is down, pricing too high can be a fatal mistake because it causes you as the seller to have to chase the market with price reductions that never quite get the property to sell. Remember, as every new property comes into a marketplace and comes on the market, all of the buyers that have been looking for a certain amount of time, they will go and they will look with anticipation at all the new properties that come up for sale, all the new listings. And if yours is priced too high, they will pass on it and it is very hard to get the marketplace to come back and pay attention to your property again. So pricing is a legitimate strategy and many people have gotten themselves in a big mess by overpricing their property. Now, of course, you can underprice your property too. What if you set the price below the market? This is what most sellers are concerned about, and that's gonna result in a faster sale, but it, it can also result in leaving money on the table which you could have gotten for that property. So you've got a price in alignment. There's a certain sort of ideal alignment with the marketplace, and that's where you need to price. I wanna give you my quote for the day. I know, here he goes quoting himself, <laughs> but I'm going to. And the quote for the day is something you always wanna remember, and it's kind of said in a snarky fashion, saying the best real estate deals never close. The best real estate deals never close. Why would I say that? Here's why. Because when a property is sold, there's a certain closing period or settlement period or escrow period that happens after the documents are signed and you think you have a deal. It might be 30 days, it might be 40 days, 45 days, it might be six months, it just depends. Every property is different. 
But during that time, one of the parties, if the deal wasn't good for them, figures that out many times, and they find a way to weasel out of the deal. So if they priced it too low, the seller will try and find a way to back out of the deal. If the buyer overpaid, the buyer will find a way to get out of the deal. So that's my quote, and it's worth remembering because I've seen it play out many, many times over the years that the best real estate deals never close. Fair deals, they close. So make a fair deal for both parties in the transaction and so that you have a win-win and the deal can get to the closing table. So action items, write a selling strategy. Again, this doesn't have to be anything real elaborate just like the other lessons. A paragraph or two will do the job. Where will you set the starting price of the property? What's the minimum acceptable price? When will you reduce the price and why will you do it? So this is your badge action. Use the template, it'll help you articulate a plan and uh, include that starting price, that minimum acceptable, and what conditions will trigger price reductions. Upload a screenshot, you'll get your badge, and I'll talk to you on the next lesson.